Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I'm here with Aaron Moore, account director, and Kara Moon, senior inbound marketing specialist, both from True Marketing. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having me. You know, um, this episode today might sound boring for some people. It might sound really, really exciting and engaging to others. It depends on where you are in your marketing organization. I think everybody should get excited about this and that's metrics, but not just talking about metrics, like what should you be measuring in general, but we're going to talk about metrics in the context of how much marketing has changed over the past 12 months and how that should be reflected on your dashboards and your activity metrics, because now is the time to make changes. We just started a new year. So great time for this topic. I'm so glad that you guys suggested that we bring this to the show today. Yeah. And I would say Kara and I definitely both think that metrics are very interesting. So we're excited to be here. Awesome. Every month is always the best day. It's metrics day. <laughs> it's metrics day. Yeah. It should be like a thing, right? Every year we should have a special yeah. drink or something. <laughs> we I think Kara celebrates things. metrics day, the, uh, the first of every month. <laughs> yeah, <I knew. laughs> Yesterday was metrics day, you know, first day back from break. And <laughs> day to come back. I love it. I love it. Well, to give some context to today's conversation, let's start with just what changes have happened in marketing. If someone's been under a rock the past 12 to 18 months, um, what are some of the things that have driven these changes um, over the past few years? Yeah, a lot's changed. Um, a lot has changed in terms of, I think, the marketing channels, but it's also changed in how people are interacting with marketing. So a couple big things, just to kind of boil it down to a few points, AI. Um, AI kind of made a gigantic splash last year, both generative AI in terms of writing content, creating different forms, uh, repurposing content, you know, all of that. And then also these AI chat search tools. So Bing has a tool, Google has a tool, there's SGE for the search generative experience baked into actual search itself for Google. There's a lot of new ways that people are searching for information and AI has been impacting both the content that's there and how you're, you're getting that content. So that's been a huge change. Um, Google itself has changed really significantly. I think last year was one of the most volatile years in terms of the search algorithm content uh, and what Google is looking for and considers good content has changed really significantly. So in terms of what is showing up for each query, it's a totally different ball game than it was a year ago, 18 months ago. Honestly, even over the last few months, it's changed. So that's been a giant, giant change that's impacted a lot of us. We've seen it in our search uh, results and we've seen it on our website metrics. Um, and then also people are looking for things in different spots. So the idea of kind of multimodal search. So yes, people start searches in Google, but they're also starting searches in YouTube. Um, on the B2C side, TikTok has increased more than any other search channel as a platform that people are going to, to look for information. So they're not actually starting a search in Google. They're starting it in TikTok. Doesn't impact us as much, but we do see that happen when it comes to YouTube. We see it happen in, um, Things like Reddit or GitHub or Stack Overflow, a lot of the times people will look for a specific technical answer in those platforms. And we also see it in some other Google platforms. Um, so I mentioned search generative experience. It's also happening in uh, like the Bing chat. People might start to search there. It might happen in Google Shopping. So a lot of different channels that people are looking for info. And then finally, 
that volume content model that kind of was really, really popular when inbound first became an idea of you write a blog post every two weeks or every month and you're just producing content. And if you keep producing content, you're going to be found. That doesn't work anymore. There's just this overflow of information. People are tired. Email isn't working as well. Everything is just, there's too much content um, and there's too much untargeted content and our audience isn't responding like they used to. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. Kara, anything to lot. add? Yeah, I would say in response to all these changes, we're definitely seeing some shifts in uh, the approaches marketers are taking. So we're seeing a more diversified channel strategy um, with the decrease in organic traffic because of all the changes to Google and the introduction of AI and the multimodal search. We're seeing an increase in digital advertising and in industry advertising. Um, events are coming back, you know, especially after COVID, there's more in-person events and that's being introduced into strategies more as well as increased focus in PR and public relations. Um, so with that, we're also seeing a lot of uh, specific channel strategies. So instead of one broad message, you know, what you're going to do on LinkedIn is going to be a lot different than what you're going to segment with your email or on YouTube. Every platform needs its own strategy. Okay, so I, obviously today we're going to be talking about metrics. That's our focus. So for those of you listening, if you want to dive further into some of these big changes that have happened, two good episodes to listen to that uh, we recorded just in the last quarter would be our end of year wrap up where we talk about some of this. And also Dale Bertrand came on and went really deep on search. So definitely check those out. Uh, we, we covered a lot last year. So obviously, uh, you know, search all you want, but, but those two stand out as being sort of these um, shifting. Oh, and we had one on GA4. Uh, Casey came on and talked about GA4. That's another good one. So um so that's great context to to get us started, but but obviously we want to take a deeper look at measurement. So speaking of GA4, that's probably a really good place to start. Of how is this new platform impacted reporting? So GA4 isn't just the new iteration of Google Analytics. I think a lot of people had that that thought of it just got a facelift. You know, it it looks a little different. Um, it actually measures everything in a totally different way. It's a different measurement model that fuels the tool. So it, I think a lot of people went into it expecting it to feel a little bit more familiar than it does. And that has maybe scared some people off. Um, but it's, it's actually a really good rethinking of Google Analytics. So a lot of people got familiar with Universal Analytics and kind of accepted some of the quirks, things like bounce rate, um, time on page were really critical. But a lot of people had this problem with bounce rate where it didn't measure activity. So if you came to a blog post and sat there and read the whole thing and left, it counted as a bounce. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That never wow. made sense. And so a lot of people architected their tool so that they could have these goals in there that said, like, if somebody's on this page for 10 seconds or something like that, don't count it as a bounce. So it was a lot of work to customize it so that it actually kind of made better sense. Um, because somebody, again, reading a blog post, sitting there for 30 seconds, a minute and leaving, that, that isn't a bounce, like they took an activity. So Google Analytics for kind of corrects for a lot of this by introducing this engagement model that says, we're gonna measure a couple different things, put those all into this, this you know algorithm or this formula, if you will, and say, if people have done a couple of these things, we're gonna say that they're engaged. And we're going to shift this model from time on page to engaged time and engaged visits and, and things like that, that mean a little bit more and actually reflect, you know, how much time did they spend on your site? Have they been clicking on buttons? Have they been scrolling? Um, all these things that indicate that they are a, a worthwhile visitor um, and you should be paying attention. And then it also, again, not a big problem in the B2B world for a lot of our clients, but it will combine things like app traffic and um, website traffic so that they're not tracking as different people and connected. You're actually able to see all of those different platforms kind of in one spot, you're able to see people on their activity across devices a bit more easily because that's a big thing. How many times do you open something on your phone and then decide to look at it on your computer? So it's it fixes for some of that stuff that is just, it became a lot more common the last few years versus when you know universal analytics was introduced. Okay, so I, I heard you say the word uh, engagement, I don't know, seven or eight times just then. Yeah. So I'm curious, has the concept of engagement as a key metric 
proliferated to other for other channels or ways of measuring things? I, I see Kara's yeah. like nodding her head emphatically. Yes. <laughs> yes. I feel like that's like the new bu buzzword is engagement because you'll, we'll, you'll see it in LinkedIn, especially is it they have an engagement rate? How engaging are your posts? A good benchmark for LinkedIn is two to 5% engagement. So if somebody's liking, clicking, commenting, sharing, that is all impacting your engagement rate on your social media platform. So um, we've seen an average of 7% on several of our clients and on our social posts as well. So a good way of seeing how engaged your audience is and what they're responding to is to do a content audit, um, which goes back to another podcast episode we did recently as well. Good time of year for marketing audits, but definitely a good time of year to see what posts are most engaging on, on LinkedIn. As far as YouTube watch time, how long is your audience spending on your videos? Are they making it past the introduction? Are they getting 75% of the way through? What types of videos are they most interested in? Um, on your CRM database, like how engaged is your database as a whole? HubSpot has this feature now where you can stop sending emails to unengaged contacts, which means that anybody that hasn't opened an email in the last 11 email sends, I think it is, where they came up with 11, I don't know, but HubSpot considers that an unengaged contact. Um, you can make sure that they stay out of your metrics to improve your open rates and your click-through rates. Um, so yeah, we're seeing engagement across the board, really. Hey, now, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned HubSpot, so because it it made me wonder, it's, it sounds like, Aaron, you spoke very positively about GA4 and you like it, like it fix a lot of problems, enhance some things. It makes more sense. But I know that there's a tendency to like all in one platform. I just want to get all my metrics out of HubSpot. So now, or whatever platform people are on, obviously not everybody's on HubSpot. So uh, do you guys find yourself with clients and with um, Marketing True, which of course, Kara, that you you oversee, do you find yourself using both or orienting, orienting yourself towards one or the other? I'll say even more than that, I'm seeing a lot of need to go get metrics from each channel specifically. So Kara mm -hmm. can speak to this, but a lot of metrics come directly from, you have to log into your YouTube um, and actually look at your dashboard, or you have to log into LinkedIn. Uh, there isn't, at least as of the last time I looked at HubSpot, which was yesterday, um, there isn't engagement metrics in there. They haven't caught up to that. I would imagine they have to change their model um, because right now it just is kind of the old way of measuring. Yeah. But as of right now, if you want any of those new metrics, you have to go to GA4. Um, and I, I would say it's, I would strongly recommend that. I would strongly recommend that people go direct to GA4 for those um, versus leaning on kind of the old way of measuring uh, and going through something like HubSpot or even like some of these other measurement platforms don't have the GA4 metrics in them. And I do think that's something that you'll want to keep an eye on. If it's not on your scorecard for 2024, add it um, because I, I think everything is going to have to shift that way as we've already seen with a lot of the channels. I will add to that, that if they are pulling web metrics to pick one platform or the other. So if you're in HubSpot and you're using HubSpot analytics for all of your traffic data, stick to HubSpot as your point of truth and then pull like the engagement rate out of GA4 because they're not gonna measure your web sessions the same. HubSpot's gonna give you one number, GA4 is gonna give you another number. So definitely pick point of truth for your system and then use the different channels to supplement that data. I like your word choice of, of point of truth. And I know it could be so frustrating to marketers that those numbers don't add up or align. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really the compare that you're after, right? Are we doing better? Or are we doing worse? <laughs> so mm -hmm. just keep that in mind. Choose one uh, thing as your source of truth and, and stick with it. Re really good advice. Yeah. The different ones are good for comparing trends, but like Kara said, I mean, they're it's just like GA4 and Universal Analytics. Those numbers are never going to match. If you had them both running at the same time before July of last year, you know that they looked really different because they have different models of how they're measuring. You know, one is aggregating visits based on your user logins and, and one is counting everything as an independent session. They're going to be totally different. It's the same thing with HubSpot and GA4. They're not the same tool. They're not built by the same company. They're not using the same model. Um, the numbers are never going to match, but the trend should match. And if they don't, that's where you know that there's a problem with one of your sources. Okay. 
All right. So I'm now thinking, okay, I'm putting myself in the position of a marketer starting off a new year. I already have a dashboard. I have things that I've been measuring that I report to executives. I have other things I've been reporting more tactically. What are what are metrics that I've been looking at for years that you would suggest I continue to look at? Like what what old things are carrying forward and still relevant? Yep. I'll chime in to start on this. Um, so you don't need to throw everything away. I know a lot of people got pretty stressed out with the shift of GA4 with some of these channel uh, shifts because- there was this fear of like, what do I report on? Uh, if you're telling me that bounce rate doesn't matter anymore, like I can't just stop reporting on it. So what a lot of people did, especially last year, while that swap was actively happening is they measured some of the old metrics and new metrics in tandem. So whether or not you sunset bounce rate page, you know, time on page, things like that, you can still keep looking at your overall visits. I think this is still a really healthy metric for everyone to keep an eye on just to see Volume wise, it's one of your first indicators if there's something wrong with your search profile, with your website, anything like that is looking at those overall numbers. Um, and we'll talk about reporting cadence and things like that. But this is actually one that if you wanted to look at weekly, it's it's an appropriate high level metric to look at just kind of consistently keep an eye on. So that's an easy one. Um, some of your lead metrics for most companies, these didn't change. You're still going to look at how many leads are you getting? Where are they coming from? Like how many form submissions do you have? Uh, what's that form submission conversion rate? And then deeper down the funnel, what is like your lead to MQL conversion? Things like that. Um, there really hasn't been a big shift as far as I've seen in what people care about looking at and how they're looking at it. So the lead numbers, the conversion rates, things like that, that's tended to stay pretty steady. Um, and that's that's something that a lot of people are reporting on again, weekly, monthly, mm -hmm. uh, on a pretty regular cadence. Okay. And then I would also look at just really quick, um, your top channels. So there are channel specific metrics we'll get into, but thinking about like how many visits are coming through referrals and what referral sites are sending them. Also inform uh, information you're gonna wanna keep an eye on that is still relevant. It still impacts your marketing. Um, you know, who's sending you traffic? How are people getting to your site? Are they coming through organic video? Are they coming through a social channel? Uh, that's still something you'll want to want to pay attention to. Yeah. And I just want to make a quick comment that some people are moving away from having so much gated content, right? They're having things that are just either 100% readily available or maybe 80% of that information is available and maybe 20% is behind a form. And with that strategy change, one would expect to have fewer form uh, submit. So it's just important to set those goals appropriately based on your strategy and then educate that this isn't a bad thing that that dropped and then use other uh, metrics like the new engagement one to show success of that strategy. So uh, just a mm -hmm. quick note there. All right, Kara, what are you yes. thinking? What are you keeping around? I would say as far as campaign reporting, a lot of that is going to stay the same as well. I mean, if you have a a campaign and your goal is to book a certain amount of meetings or have certain form completions or conversions, your conversion rate's not going to change. Your influence contacts, your ROI, all of that is going to stay the same as far as campaign reporting. So none of the new metrics, changes to marketing is going to affect the traditional way that we've reported on campaigns. Okay. Well, let's dive into the channels a little bit deeper. What channel success metrics should people be tracking? I would say on, so email lately, we have been seeing a increase in bounce rates. And so keeping an eye on um, your bounces and making sure that your email security, like all the filters are changing. And so, so many emails are not making it through those filters. So having that set up correctly, but cleaning out your database. And so if you have a database full of invalid contacts, use an email cleaning tool to clean that up and decrease that bounce rate. So you increase your engagement, your open, your flex, all of that. Do you have any um, email cleanup tools that you would recommend? Yes. So we love Never Bounce. Never Bounce, we recommend it. It's really become every client lately that we've been working with, especially with the HubSpot onboarding or email strategy, we're constantly running lists through Never Bounce. And it's really nice because it will take that list and it will tell you like how many of them are valid contacts how many of them are unsure? 
and then how many are invalid, which you just don't want to send to the invalids at all. They don't exist or they're not the company anymore. So highly recommend Never Bounds and it's super cost effective as well. Great. All right. Anything else on channel success metrics? Yeah, we'll, we'll go uh, channel grouping by channel grouping. So sorry Okay, right bring now. it. Um, a couple of the other ones that I know we need to touch on. Kara will tackle ads in a second, digital advertising. One thing that I've seen a big uptick in interest in, and Kara kind of alluded to this earlier, events came back and a lot of the events are tied to industry advertising, publications. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of that whole group of like event sponsorships and, and paying for a, a digital placement. So what we're seeing is, you know, A, a lot of interest has, has kind of gone into that from our clients. So I'm evaluating a lot of these opportunities as are some of our other account directors in terms of, is this the right audience for you? How cost-effective is it to reach them? How, what actions are going to come out of this? Um, this is an area that I think a lot more people should, should really dig into measurable impact. Now, if it comes to something like brand awareness being your goal, it's, you know, you're not going to necessarily look at the leads coming out of it, but you are going to want to look at those overall impressions. You're going to want to look at visits um, and that you're ideally going to want to actually have something measurable because what I found is sometimes those numbers that the publisher set, um, you don't quite achieve. And if you're going for, you know, a benchmark goal that they have, and assuming that you're getting that and you're actually falling quite short, your cost per action gets a lot higher. And when you're comparing channels, which is, again, something that I strongly, strongly recommend everyone do, compare the cost of like a lead acquisition, if that's your goal, from your organic content. You know, how much did it cost you to create that piece to promote it? Compare it to your digital ads in something like Google ads uh, or LinkedIn ads and then compare it to these, these publishers because what we're finding is that the publishers, there's a lot of benefits to working with publishers, to working with event sponsorships. But if you're going solely for something like leads, um, they end up being very, very expensive. We do not see that being necessarily the most impactful way to get those leads. It might be a great way to reach specific audiences. So you might still keep it in rotation. But if you don't look at the same results, tracking to your goals across these channels, it's really hard to kind of um, fight for increased event budget or fight for this, this, uh, digital advertising budget, everything's gotten more expensive. Um, and you might find that you're spending money in the wrong spots for your goals. You might find that there's more effective ways to reach an audience. So when it comes to things like industry ads, sponsorships and event sponsorships, think about what your overall goal is. Um, does it support that overall goal, whether that be brand awareness, lead gen, um, you know, meetings, things like that. And then look yeah. at things like cost per result. So again, if your goal is leads, how much is your cost per lead for each of those channels? Um, what is the expectation that the publisher is setting when you sign up? Is it that you do this email blast and you get 150 leads? Track that, track it within your tools to see, okay, I got 30 leads. My lead acquisition was $300 per lead. You know, that's not a reasonable acquisition cost. So the more uh, benchmarking that you can put in there and the more tracking, I think the better equipped you are to understand like how things are helping you. But I would say for sure, like cost per results for these sponsorships, um, setting these benchmarks, looking at traffic and lead quality. So if you have something like HubSpot, like who are these people? Are they students? Are they in your target countries? Are they high level executives? that's really going to impact how much that lead is worth to you or how much that visit is worth to you. So like as much context as you can put into these, you'll be in a much better position to understand they're high cost. They're really expensive. Is it worth your money? Is that doing something for you or is there a more effective channel for your specific goal? You know, um, I'm glad you brought up the context because of course, trade shows in particular, just to pick on that real fast, is going to have a higher cost per lead. Like no doubt, we, we all, but if that quality of lead or those other goals, not just leads, but but other things make it worthwhile, right? So it's yep. a matter of, and of course, the holy grail of tracking all the way to a sale and the full life cycle of that customer. And they started a trade show, but now they spend- <laughs> you know, half a million dollars for their company every year. Like it would be great to have that, all of that attribution. We know that a lot of times that isn't, um, you know, that's more of a pipe dream. Uh, but I like your cost per action that you mentioned. And also just the, the context, like I said, of 
acknowledging that this is a more costly way to acquire this person, but all these other things make it worthwhile or not, or not. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people get really intimidated by that because it's not, it's not served up to you. It's something you have to kind of think about of how you're going to track that, what the expectation is on benchmarking. So really push when you're working with publishers and working with events for those expectations up front, stick it in a, a scorecard, a dashboard somewhere, say, you know, for this email blast, we expect to get 150 leads. This email blast costs $3,000. That means each lead costs us X. And then look at it, say, you know, set up a campaign in your marketing automation tool, or if they give you an Excel spreadsheet of people who clicked, how many leads are in there? How many of those did you already have versus how many are new? So then you can say, okay, overall cost per person is X, but you know what? 30% of those were already in our system. So our cost per new lead is actually substantially higher. There's some pretty easy ways that I think you can, you can add that benchmarking on here. Um, that again, sometimes you look at these numbers and you go, oh, holy cow, like that that's so expensive per person. We thought this was a great channel. We've just been doing this forever. We haven't really been asking these questions. And when you kind of peel back that layer, you understand that it's it's just a really expensive channel. Or you might get the opposite. I'll put a you know a, a word in charge DVs events. Phenomenal cost per lead acquisition. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, so sometimes you're really pleasantly surprised because it does work out. Uh, it kind of math makes it makes it a lot more competitive. And so you might say, you know, that event is eight thousand dollars, but our, our cost per lead is thirty five dollars. We don't get that from any other channel. Like we will do this all day long. So I think it just helps you make better, more informed decisions. Um, and of course, if you can layer on like, are these good leads, stuff like that, that helps you get even further along. Hey, I know you'll have other areas to walk through. What's next? Yeah, I'll switch gears here a little bit. I'll touch on the, the digital ads front. So I mentioned earlier with the changes of, you know, we're seeing less organic traffic, we're seeing a higher increased um, digital ads front. So what we're doing with LinkedIn ads and Google ads, we're doing more highly segmented ads with very specific landing pages instead of sending um, your traffic to just a general industry page or service page, we're making really more detailed segmented pages that's specific to that campaign. And then that goes back to those website traffic metrics that we were talking about earlier. How long are people spending on that page after they click on your ad? How, what's the engagement rate? Um, what are the overall page metrics? And because it's separate from your website pages as a whole, it makes reporting for that campaign a lot easier. But if you look at the platform specifically, if you're on LinkedIn, they've got some really nice demographic metrics that aid in that segmentation. So if you are trying to reach the CEO of a company, but your ad is really getting clicked from entry level, you know that you need to make changes because you're not hitting the right audience. So there's a lot of really detailed demographic metrics. You can segment it by job function, job title, industry. Um, so taking a look at that on the LinkedIn side is definitely important. Click-through rate's not going to change across the board. That's going to be your key digital ad metric driver for sure. On the Google ads front, it's really nice where you can measure your engagement or your click-through rate for specific keywords. So a lot of industries see a good average of 4 to 6% on a keyword. If it's higher than that, you know that that's a keyword you want to keep in your strategy because that's really driving a lot of the traffic to that specific landing page. Um, so definitely keeping it that in mind as well when it comes to the digital ads front. Okay. I, I know is, just a sidebar real fast. Um, how have digital ads been performing this past year? Have you seen, are they better? Are they worse? Are they about doing like they always do? Any big shakeups on that front this past year? Yeah, I'll chime in on this one. So Google ads have been actually knocking it out of the park for a lot of people. And I, I think okay. some of that is because a lot of people are struggling with organic search right now. Ah. The search results pages are just showing different information. A lot of people lost rankings uh, because Google is looking for different things. Um, and some of that is is good permanent changes. Things mm -hmm. like users are looking for different info. So Google is serving up that info. Um, there's a good example of like pre-2020, if you typed in the word masks into Google, you got Halloween masks, you're never going to get that again. 
that's not your intent. <laughs> that's not what someone's looking for now if they look for masks. So yeah. there's things like that that are like people look differently. Uh -huh. um, but yes, so we've seen a lot more people doing a lot of Google advertising as a way to kind of yeah. just replace some of those lost clicks. But we're also seeing much greater success. And I think it's because the quality of ads has greatly increased in you know the last couple of years. Google's done a lot of work on that. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of Google's ad changes with things like dynamic headlines. Um, the ad will actually adjust based on what someone's looking for. There's ways to do this intelligently. And then there's, you know, Google would like you to just load a bunch of info in and it picks everything. Um, but I, we have seen much higher success when we kind of combine that dynamic approach with like, we're going to pin a couple of these headlines to make sure the context stays. We're going to swap this out. Um, so yes, we've seen Google advertising doing really well for a lot of clients. And like Kara said, a lot of benchmarks are like 1% click through. We are very frequently seeing four to 6%. And we have some clients with ads that have a 10% click through. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been a boon for a lot of people. Um, and LinkedIn advertising has been the opposite. So a lot of people have stopped doing advertising on LinkedIn. They're not seeing it, oh, um, it paying for itself from a few Same, years yes. ago. Yeah. Right. The data is so good. I wish it worked better for people, but the cost is really high. So mm -hmm. unless your budget is also really high and like thousands of dollars a month, it's hard to get the volume that you would want. And we don't often see like leads coming from that. So again, it's like that when you look at the math, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. If you can pay a dollar for a click in Google and 3% of those convert to leads, you are going to end up with more leads than if you're paying $10 for a click on LinkedIn. And mm -hmm. it's just the budget ends up restraining it a little too much for a lot of people. Okay. Well, sorry. Metrics. It's so easy for metrics to talk about all of marketing and everything. So, okay, Wendy, yeah. get, get back focused. Um, any other channels we want to cover today? Kara, do you want to talk about like LinkedIn and YouTube? Because I feel like those are some channels that I am seeing as I've done marketing planning. A lot of people are, like you said, getting more channel specific strategies. Yeah. And I've loved the metrics. When I've looked at auditing these, some of those channels have such good information that I think if it's a priority channel, like I love it when people pay more attention to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on LinkedIn, I mentioned earlier, the big metric to track is that engagement rate. And so one of the ways we've been doing that at True is I've been pulling all of the, basically our social calendar, what type of post it is, and then what's the engagement rate on that to really see like, what is our audience resonating with? And a lot of the engagement we're seeing is generally in that 7% range. Um, two to five is good. But the document style posts are what's getting that really high engagement because every time somebody clicks through, uh, there's different words for it. Some people call it a slider. I've called it a slider. They're documents, they're PDFs basically, or images that you can click through. And those are getting really, really high engagement and are performing really well across the board. Um, as far as YouTube, watch time, average view duration, there's so many metrics in YouTube that like, they have a really robust reporting platform. They have their, their general um, high level overview, but they have a nice way of trickling down like, okay, if you have so many impressions, how many of those impressions resulted in views? And then how many views you know, resulted in um, the average view duration on that video and how many then resulted in like a, a full video watch? Wow. Um, so there's a lot to really dive into on, on the YouTube and the LinkedIn front. Yeah. And, and it can feel overwhelming. We want to just stop and recognize for the one person marketer listening going, oh my gosh, I can't possibly measure all this, do all this. And so it's all about balance. But at the end of the day, if you think about being a good steward of your budget and making sure you're investing in the right places that are actually making an impact, you can't blow off measurement. Like it's so important to measure. So you have to find that right balance. And, um, and maybe that's a good segue into how to package and present metrics because the metrics that, for instance, CARE needs to know whether or not we're doing uh, well on our own marketing of true might be different than the one she's reporting to the executive team on how healthy our overall marketing program is. So uh, ladies, how often should you measure? How much depth did you go into? How do you package this stuff? Maybe unpack that a little bit for me. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
Kara can talk about, she's got scorecards, dashboards, all kinds of things. I'll start a little bit higher level. Um, I would say monthly, we've typically got, that would be what I would call a, a scorecard versus, you know, these reporting dashboards. That's where you kind of pull up, you're ideally setting that at, you know, the start of the year when you do marketing planning and business planning, business planning feeds into your marketing planning, your marketing goals are supporting your business goals, and they are you know, 10, maybe 12 things that you're looking at across marketing, even into like how many MQLs are we giving to sales, things like that. But those should be really impactful. They should be health metrics that help you identify if something is is not working. Um, that what I, I would say, as you're doing your planning, that monthly scorecard is going to be really critical because that's realistically what you as the marketer are looking at, but also probably what your leadership is looking at to see how marketing is successful. Um, Kara can speak to like what the marketer is looking at for their own internal purposes. I do think in terms of reporting out of marketing, it's really important to have something succinct because we love data, but sometimes other people don't understand it. Their eyes glaze over. It's a little bit too much information. Yeah. So I would say that scorecard's really critical. And as you're doing your marketing plan, I always, always recommend somebody does a really thorough audit. Look at what you did last year. Um, look at all your channels, dig into metrics. And that's where you can now surface up these more important metrics that are, you know, leadership is used to seeing overall visits. They're used to seeing bounce rate. Let's shift them. Let's shift them into engagement rate. Um, you know, we've realized our audience is really active on YouTube. I'm going to introduce these, you know, this high level YouTube metric to leadership to, to better understand how people are getting to our site. Um, but that's where you can actually build all of that in your scorecard based off the audit to say, we've understood that this is a big area of opportunity. We have all this YouTube traffic. We haven't actively been cultivating this. We've just been putting videos there so that we can use them on our website, but let's make this part of our strategy. So I think the audit sets you up really well to pivot based on what's working and what's not working. And then it fuels that scorecard. So in terms of like high level stuff, I would say start with an audit and build a really strong monthly scorecard that speaks to business goals. Okay, but, but you're, I'm not letting you out of the hot seat yet. So <laughs> so if you had to say, here are the top three or four things that every marketer should consistently report on and surface to leadership, what would those be? Or is there a one size fits all? Maybe there's not. I don't, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think for some companies, it's going to be, if you care about brand awareness, your metrics are going to be different than if leadership is pounding you for leads. And I have seen companies make this pivot too, where it, you know, maybe it was a startup and you really cared about press. And so you wanted a specific number of press mentions a month, and now you've pivoted and now you've built up this really strong sales team and you need to drive sales. Now you're going to care more about leads. Um, if I had to generalize, a lot of people, I, you know, regardless of how organic search has been going. Your website is still the hub of everything you do. Yeah. You go to events, you might have a QR code on stuff. You drive people to your web, you send out emails, you drive people to web. Your web is really kind of your last owned frontier. Um, so I would say web visits is one that I see pretty much everybody capture in some way. Um, same thing, even the companies that don't really care about lead generation, I feel like you still want to know how many contacts you're getting. You still care about that, at least in terms of like, again, a health metric. If you yeah. don't care about leads today, that's fine. There's going to be a time where you probably do need to go lean on your database to drive sales, where sales is going to come to you as marketers expecting those. So that's one that I find really hard to not track yeah. um, and to not care about and have goals on. And then, um, yeah, then it just becomes channel specific. Yeah, you know, I if could you're see really the divergence. In events. Yeah, the divergence from there where you have maybe a few key channels or if if you're an organization that's uh, measuring MQLs and SQLs and all of that, some of those, you know, yeah. lead stages, I could see that being surfaced uh, for certain types yeah. of businesses. But like you said, for others that are more brand awareness, you know, engagement and, and things like that may be more important. So, or press yeah. metrics. Yeah. And a lot of the times I do see email metrics make it on there um, because I, I, most people are engaged in email in some way. So a lot of the times it's like visits from email or it's that overall bounce rate. It's your open rate. It's again, those really high level metrics that show kind of health of the platform. Yeah. Um, and I see email on there just because it is a big platform for most people. 
So it is that, that tends to be in thinking group. about it going that high level, but I understand what you're saying yeah. there. And as a marketer and a business owner, I do care about it, but, but it's like every email campaign, I don't want to know, but overall, how are people, uh, you know, in our database responding to our messages is, is good. So it's sort of that balance there too. <laughs> I think that's the big thing. It's like that top level scorecard is overall channel health metrics, make it on there, but not the really granular ones. Like right. what makes that channel successful? What makes it worth your marketing time or spend or, you know, both for a lot of people? Um, what tells you that it's healthy and what sends up a red flag if it's not healthy? So I think a lot of the times that's what makes it on that, like monthly or even quarterly scorecard that a higher audience is looking at or more people are looking at. Yeah. And then in terms of like Kara's management, she tracks so many different things. Probably Again, they have a much <laughs> but it helps you adjust strategy. And I think that's it is if you're on the ground deciding what that social post is on a daily basis, you want to know what's worked and you want to yeah. be able to see trends yeah. versus if you know you're somebody outside of marketing trying to see if like your channels are healthy and you're getting, you know, your overall goals approached, you're going to look for different stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kara, when we hired you and we found out you are a spreadsheet nut and you were really big on metrics, it was like, yes, because you, you have to be to do this job effectively. So tell, tell me about what you dig into and why and how often. So my general process. So we keep, so for true, we keep a weekly scorecard where we track on the marketing side, what are our web sessions each week? What are the number of new contacts that are coming each week? And then for last year, we had set a goal of we wanted so many contact form submissions. And we quickly realized as we were tracking these contact form submissions that we needed to modify that goal even further to say how many good service inquiry contact form submissions. And we are, are going to be modifying that for this coming year. Yeah, we're so not we, going to count the janitorial services and no, the, the guest blogging services. And the vendors, you know, like, <laughs> Just the fluff, like we realized we had a lot of that coming in, yeah. but that also helped us, you know, say like, okay, out of all of the contact form submissions we're getting, you know, this much percentage is actually good service inquiries, this much percentage, you know, we got to, to tweak a little bit. Yeah. On a monthly standpoint, this is where I, I get a little nuts in the spreadsheet, but definitely going back to what Aaron said of like, this is where your marketing goals and how they go back to your business goals, this is what you want to track. So if you're really specific into wanting to build up your LinkedIn audience, being able to track your new subscribers or your new followers, any LinkedIn newsletter subscribers that you may have, um, your overall engagement rate, which we've talked about a lot, having that on a monthly scorecard dependent on what's important to you. So for me, monthly, I track just basically every channel. So I do the email. I do YouTube, that's watch time, new subscribers, overall views. Um, I look at all of our page views specific to our website just to see like what's trending. Um, I'll also get into like thought leadership, you know, metrics where it's how many speaking events are we doing? How many books are we selling? Um, things like that. And then on a quarterly basis, I take all of that information, I put it into a slide deck, and that will be more trend specific or campaign specific. So here's all the things we executed this quarter, and here's how those things performed, and here's how we're going to modify that going into the next quarter. One of the things that I appreciate you do is you look at a by persona and you take that slice mm -hmm. and say, what types of content is resonating with a certain persona? And it's been fascinating to see some, some pretty big differences, uh, consistently different. Yeah. So this entire year, 2023, uh, we were segmenting our emails by persona and we quickly found that we had a persona that did not want to open or click. And we're like, okay, let's stop sending to that person because they had, don't have any time for email. Um, we also found that we've got a persona that likes very specific, um, of like the thought leadership content, the podcast, the, um, industrial marketing summit that we have coming up where we've got other personas that are more interested in the, the how to's and um, how to execute. And so now going forward into this year, we've got all of that data from this past year and beyond to say, we're going to have a very segmented email strategy to speak to what those personas are really actually engaging with. Yeah. 
That's great. Yeah, that's a good point Kara makes is your metrics should be able to fuel a behavior change. And so I do think if you're looking at metrics and it's just taking you a ton of time to collect them and you're not going to change behavior based on them, they may not be worth collecting. But if Mm -hmm. it's something like that, where you're looking at it based on persona, because you anticipate making a change to how you send emails based on persona, then absolutely like that fuels the decisions that you can make and that fuels you being more effective. So it's like, look at the stuff that you're spending a bunch of time and money on. If you send a lot of emails and you're spending a lot of time on that, like look at your email metrics in a really deep manner to make sure it's warranted. Um, And if you think you're going to make a change on that, look at those metrics as well, kind of proactively set that up so you can track it just so you can adjust your strategy to to make your marketing more effective. Um, Mm. But for some of those, like keep the lights on channels, like for some people, they're still on, you know, X formerly known as Twitter, but it's a keep your lights on type of situation. I wouldn't look at those metrics really deeply. Um, and, you know, that's something you look at in an audit and say, is this even worth it? Is it worth the small amount of time we spend? Is there opportunity here we're not uncovering? And I think that's where like going into marketing planning, you pick your couple channels that have the most potential. It might be channels that you've been really active in. It might be emerging channels for you. Like YouTube has been for a lot of people the last few years. Um, But that's where you can then go, okay, great. This is an emerging channel. We're going to get really deep into metrics, have like six months of let's see, uh, let's experiment. Let's see what changes things. And then the next six months we can say, oh, persona A loves these videos. We're going to make more videos because they're a critical persona for us. And we want to get more customers like that. So I think that's where you can just adjust a little bit more based on what information you've collected and what's working. Right. Mm -hmm. And these platforms will share all kinds of data and some of it is maybe not so interesting or actionable. And I don't know why this just made me think about uh, Spotify and the wrapped and how it told you what college town, you know, you're listening to. And, and then the podcast platform that we use uh, for this is called Buzzsprout. And it's kind of like a HubSpot in that you publish one place and then it publishes to Apple and Spotify many places. And, and, um, Buzzsprout also created sort of that end of year cool video wrap up and it had some, you know, interesting, good metrics, but other things were just kind of fluffy and random. But I love that some of these companies are sort of making metrics exciting. (laughs) I got an email the other day from Jimmy John's that was one of those like wrapped and it told you how many sandwiches you ate and how many inches it was and like what your favorite order was. I was just like, oh my gosh, like how many calories you consume. I don't need to know that. I I I do not shame me about my Jimmy John's. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Uh, Well, okay. So, uh, so on that note, are there any other tools? I know we've hit on quite a few and it sounds like the dream of all in one that we can go to one place and measure everything. That's, that's way over sadly. Um, so you go to each channel specific place for the most part, um, any other tools that you use that that all in one dream is, is nice. And I think a lot of like, even HubSpot a couple of years ago was like, we're all in one. And now they've shifted to this. We have integrations for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have this really strong tool database because no tool can ever be all in one and no metric Mm -hmm. platform will ever be all in one. But there's one that I've been really, really, really loving. It's a Google tool. It's called Looker Studio. It used to be like Google Data Cloud or something like that. Um, and you can actually pull in sources like Google Analytics, Google Ads, Google Search Console. And there are some integrations with other tools, but you can build these really, you can build basically whatever dashboard you want. So it's, if you have a strong idea of what you want to see, it's wonderful. And if you want kind of a pre curated dashboard, they do have some of those, but it can be a little intimidating to just dig in. Um, but you drag and drop, you can like add labels. So it's been really great for building like automated reports for um, Google Analytics. GA4 doesn't have the ability to like auto send dashboards, which is something Universal Analytics did. So if that's something you need, you would go into Looker Studio, connect the data source and just build whatever dashboard you want. Um, and it's it's been really great. And you can just set it up so that it automatically sends to a list of people once a month on the first day of the month, for instance. So that one's good for building dashboards across tools, but it's also, it's just a good way of getting that like automated high level reporting um, that doesn't exist in GA4 for some reason. Uh, and it's a lot more malleable. So you can actually like, just process the data a little bit differently than you would within 
uh, GA4. So if you are a little bit of a data nerd like Kara and myself, I find it a lot more user friendly. I feel like I get frustrated when I try to do some of the filtering in GA4. So this is kind of my hack to like, I just want to quickly get this info. Yeah. I don't want to have to apply a bunch of filters and then add fields. And anyway, it's, it can be a little bit easier once you know how to use it. Okay. Looker, L-O-O-K-E-R. Looker. Yep. Got Looker it. Studio. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, Kara, any, anything we haven't brought up already? My tried and true are Excel and HubSpot. <laughs> Those are my two that I'm constantly using. Um, I, the one thing I do do in all of the spreadsheets though, is we had talked about like, there is no all-in-one platform that you have to go into each specific channel and to get that. And so I have a column in these spreadsheets that tells me exactly where these analytics are coming from. Because if you have anybody coming in and looking at your spreadsheets or um, you're sending reports to leadership, then everyone knows it's very transparent on where that is. But then you don't get to the next month and you're like, crap, where did I find that metric? Because oh, that's that so problem. smart. <laughs> and an easy thing to do. And, and like we talked about, you need this source of truth where you stay yeah. consistent. So yeah, it seems obvious. I borrowed that from Kara. I've started, I've started doing that across spreadsheets because the numbers don't match up. Even something mm -hmm. like keyword research, Moz and SEMrush and Google ads going to have totally different numbers. So if you specify where it is, it starts to make a little bit more sense um, yeah. versus just pulling numbers from anywhere because they will be very, very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, any parting advice for the overwhelmed marketer that's listening to this and going, oh, where do I start or what do I prioritize? What, what, what would you tell them? Just start digging. I feel like the interesting thing with metrics is if you're intimidated by it, you're not going to learn how to do it by not doing it. Um, you're, you're really not going to mess anything up. Like go into GA4, start playing with stuff, open things, dig. Google's pretty good about giving you definitions. If you don't know what engagement rate is, you can hover over it. It'll tell you exactly how it gets there. Just look at your metrics and ask yourself questions. And I think that's the biggest piece is like, why does this matter? Versus just reporting on something because it's there, like ask yourself, like, what does this change about my behavior? What does this inform? Um, because ideally that's, that's the point of collecting metrics is to better inform what you're doing. So I think always asking that question of like, why do I care about top level visits? Mm -hmm. Is it to make sure we're maintaining? Is it because I'm going to change behavior? I think having that lens helps make much more meaningful scorecards, metrics reports, you know, what have you. Um, and then, yeah, just dig, just like ask yourself questions as you go, poke around, play with things. I, that's the only way you're going to learn is if you just kind of start doing it. I would say too, that knowing your goals will give you that starting point. So mm -hmm. if your goal is LinkedIn, then start with the LinkedIn metrics, dive in there. And then naturally all of the metrics that you're going to be adding to your spreadsheets or your scorecards, your slide decks will evolve and it will expand, but knowing what your overall goal is, will give you that place to start. Yeah. And, and I'll add a third one, talk to you, whoever it is that you're reporting to talk, that business leadership, talk to them, do a check-in and be like, was this informative? What, what would you like to see? What would you not like to see? Um, how do we want to use this time when I come and I'm reporting and we're discussing, you know, plans for next quarter. And that way, you know, that you're not getting glazed over looks. You're, you know, that you're showing things that are resonating and are actionable. So it'd be good too. All right. Well, and oh, if you ahead. want cheat codes for any of these, there are training tools for a lot of these HubSpot. If you're using that as a tool, there's nice. the Academy for pretty much every single piece of that tool. Um, there's like an email training there's anyway, it will give you probably more info than you want, but it's a good foundation. Yeah. Um, Google is the same way. There's Google ads training. There's Google analytics for training. So it's a good starting point for sure. Sometimes it's more info than you need. Sometimes it's, you know, you don't need the certification, but it is always a good starting point. So yeah. I always recommend those. Awesome. What a, what a robust, wonderful episode this was. I think we're all excited about metrics now, even if we weren't before. I know you guys were, <laughs> but thank you for sharing your knowledge today. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for Thanks, having us. Wendy. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. For show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. 
While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.